need the music stand. There's one up there. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this beautiful Sunday morning. We continue this season through the Easter season and explore the theme, All Are Welcome, including me. And we're going to be discussing how the book of Acts preaches all this Easter season about God's unending welcome to all people. So uh, with that, I'd like to invite you to, if you will, register your attendance in the cards that say welcome in the pews. And during any time of music, you can bring those with your offering to the offering plates, and we'll know that uh, who's here joining us in worship today. Also, if you have any prayer that you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to write that on the pray card, which can be handed to the ushers during the singing of our first hymn this morning. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Chris Ableton forward. She has an invitation to service for all of us this morning. I feel like I'm up here a lot lately. That's right. <laughs> uh, in our church office, we have volunteers who work. Um, Betty Enoch and Betsy Critchfield are two that are there faithfully every week. Um, They're having a need to have more volunteers. There is, it's inside your bulletin today is a list of some of the jobs that are in there. But let me tell you, some of the pluses to working in the office is you know first what's going on and what's coming up <laughs> and you hear stuff from the other members and stuff it's really quite fun to be in there it's a very friendly group um, it also will give Kathy Barr a chance to know more of you personally she's lovely to work with and wants you to be happy if you come in and work for her um, that also includes Molly which you all know Molly is easy to work for she wants you to be happy too so think about it the office is open 9 to 3 we're not asking you to work 9 to 3 although you're more than welcome to stay for the day um, I believe Thursdays or is it Thursdays it's taco uh, tacos on Thursdays that's right so you yeah. might want to work through lunchtime <laughs> but please you can email them you can go in the office and talk the emails are on the bottom of the flyer you can talk to anyone from the office, Betsy and Betty included, and, um, or just walk in one day and tell them that you're interested. It's a fun, simple job. They have other extra things beyond this, like if there's mailings, they'll ask you to stuff envelopes, stuff like that. You're all capable, and I think you'd enjoy it. So join us in the office. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we can use all the help we can get, and thank you, Chris, for that announcement. Herman, would you come forward? Uh, we also want to share a special opportunity and um, an exciting thing that's coming up in the, in the uh, career of our music minister, Herman Hope. Uh, Herman, would you share about that with us? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I wanted to share the exciting news that I have been selected uh, to participate in Frost School of Music through the University of Miami to participate in a summer program, a summer in Salzburg. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> thank you, yeah. yeah. So with approval, I've made the executive decision that the choir will be having the month of July off, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and I'll be flying out uh, July 10th. The program goes from July 11th through August 11th. 
Uh, you can thank John Ellis for helping me keep connected and get into that. However, with such late notice, uh, I'm a little low on funds and I'm looking to fundraise to help pay for the tuition for this. So I'm giving a fundraising and benefit concert on May 28th at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Uh, I'll be doing all sorts of songs with Paloma. Uh, my friend Kevin Fan will be accompanying us. We'll be doing selections, uh, pieces, art pieces that I'd be singing in Germany, pieces I learned while I was in college, as well as selections from West Side Story and reprising the prayer. So uh, if you'd like to come and support me, it would mean the world to me, but even just knowing that I have your support, uh, financial or not, means the world to me. So thank you so much for uh, enjoying this opportunity with me. I'll make sure to take lots of pictures. Amen, thank you, thank you. So yeah, save the date on your calendar, March 28th, uh, sorry, May 28th at uh, 2, 2 p.m., right? Yes. Here in the sanctuary, good, good. So uh, with that, will you join me and stand up for the call to worship this morning? Let us join together. Come, Holy Spirit, weave us together in prayer, praise, and song. Unite us, dear God, as one strong fabric of faith. By the power of your life and love, raise us with you from death to new life. Through our acts of compassion, resurrect our souls once again. Come, Holy Spirit, give us life today and always. May our songs of praise please you now and forevermore. scripture this morning is Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of the Lord.
Reading from Acts 9, verses 36 through 42. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near to Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling to the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us pray before I offer a message this morning. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we continue with our theme, All Are Welcome, Even Me, and we rehearse these stories of acts where God's Spirit welcomes more and more people each week and each scripture story that we read. It was striking this past week that uh, as we read about Tabitha and I was studying this sermon uh, text, I was invited to the home of Larry Runyon and we talked a good deal about his wife Evelyn who began our prayer shawl ministry. And remembering that Tabitha was, of course, a maker of fabrics, uh, I, th I said to Larry, how many of those prayer shawls were made? And we talked about the history of that ministry. Over a thousand have been given to people in our church and people beyond our church. If you've ever received a prayer shawl yourself, will you raise your hand nice and high? What a blessing. And let's uh, give thanks and praise for that ministry. We see on the altar today many of the prayer shawls that are going to be given away in the future. Each time we do so, we say a prayer over that prayer shawl. You all bless it with your blessing. And then it is given with all of our love to the person who needs that healing touch. And for those of you who have received these, I'm sure you're aware of that, that sensation that this feels like an embrace from the whole church as it's been blessed for you. And it's remarkable how people hold on to these prayer shawls in their time of illness or even in their last moments in this lifetime and how even afterwards a family will keep that shawl after a person's passing. How filled with meaning that gift is. And we see that that's happening in the story of Tabitha. Tabitha, we see that there's a wonderful uh, spirit among these women who surround her after her death, she was clearly an important follower of the way, of the way of Jesus, and she had done many good works in his name. Our story begins, it says, Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. That's Acts 9, verse 36. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. Now, uh, this word disciple is used here for Tabitha, and that's not common when it comes to uh, women in the Bible. This is a wonderful moment that lifts up the importance of a key female figure in the Bible. In fact, this version of the word disciple in Greek has a feminine ending. This is the only place that that happens in the New Testament. Uh, the word for disciple in Greek appears with its feminine suffix in this in this passage. So anyone who's ever said that the Bible doesn't allow women to be in leadership in the faith has not spoken with the author of Acts, <laughs> has not read their Bible very carefully. This woman was a leader, a disciple. 
considered on par pretty much with the 12 disciples, a leader in the early church. And it also says she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. After she died and when they called Peter to the house, her friends brought these fabrics that she had made and wanted to show off her handiwork. It seems that she had probably made these garments for them. These were people in need, friends who wore her clothing as gifts donated to them. These were act, her acts of charity to make garments for those in need. So after she dies, people, uh, these women grasped for these fabrics or were, they were wearing them and they were showing Peter the handiwork that she had made. And much like these shawls, they must have been aware that every stitch was the handiwork of Tabitha. If you want to, you can recall that the creator of one of these shawls or in that fabric that Tabitha made, every stitch was a work of her hands. It's truly as though her hands are embracing and showing love to the person who wears that garment. And what's more, there seems to be a fabric of faith, these women who weave themselves together instinctively. It's a wonderful story of the power of these female relationships in this scripture today. How apt that for Mother's Day we, we remember this story on this Mother's Day weekend. So we we have a story of women who weave themselves together and come together to be stronger in that fabric of faith. They do not grieve alone. They are together as one. This is a powerful story and a powerful lesson of how we should cope with our own grief. In fact, it's striking that all of this is happening before Peter ever gets there. It's as though the resurrection has already begun. She has been celebrated. She's been remembered. They are already gathering the things that she has made. It's as though the stirring of all the love in that room primed the pump for this miracle. It readied the room for this resurrection miracle that Peter would uh, facilitate that day. We're reminded of this power of faith and the power of relationships that when we grieve, when we're confused, when we are lost, we must do as these women did. Come together and remember our bonds. Remember the ways that God has blessed us. And then they act quickly to get Peter into the room where he, of course, kneels with her and prays with her and miraculously she is revived to life. We are reminded of these things and we celebrate this prayer shawl ministry. As I've said, we have given over a thousand of these shawls. This all began uh, about 24 years ago when Evelyn Runyon herself was given a prayer shawl in 1999, uh, 23 years ago. In 1999, a loved one gave her a shawl before her procedure, and she was so moved by it, she wanted to pass this gift on to others. So she invited people to make these prayer shawls. And here, 23 years later, we continue to give them today. This, too, is a weaving together of our church in a fabric of faith. Amen? We're invited this morning to remember that all are welcome in this fabric. Just as last week we, we saw how the Holy Spirit was incorporating people of different cultures and languages and uh, now the, the, now the Holy Spirit is showing its power through women in particular. And it's so wonderful that we celebrate this scripture on Mother's Day weekend, on Mother's Day itself. We also heard on the, the 23rd Psalm um, the same assurance that we come through our hardest challenges through relationships, through this fabric of faith and through God's own presence. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. On Mother's Day, we remember that we are not alone, that we began nurtured in the love of our mothers. A 
church member, David Thompson, shared with me a wonderful piece that uh, it's a video that I'd like to send out to the church either on the buzz on Wednesday or perhaps via email. It's Bobby McFerrin leading his choir in singing the 23rd Psalm. And every time it comes to the name of God or a pronoun for God, he has them sing she. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She leads me in paths of righteousness. She leads me beside still waters. And it's a wonderful maternal image of God. I invite you to enjoy that um, on YouTube this, this coming week when you're able to watch it. We remember our mothers as this source of unconditional love. We hopefully had that experience of our mothers. Um, many of us uh, hopefully did. And uh, I'd like to invite us to meditate on that maternal love at this time. That maternal love which taught us what this fabric of faith is like. Think about that love that was there from your mother when no one else was willing to put up with our behavior. Our mother was there for us. We often think of that love as teaching us in the beginning years of our lives about what God's love really is. But if we'd like to, we can access that, mother, that mother's love at any moment. I invite you to meditate on our mothers. And if necessary, think about some maternal figure in your life. Whoever show, showed you that unconditional maternal love, bring her to mind in this time. Allow her to encourage you. What would she say to support you, to affirm you? How would she bless the work you've tried to do and be faithful to that love. I invite us to return to that love. We can even think of God as our mother. Pray to God as our eternal mother just as we can to God as our father and access that unconditional love and receive it. Amen? If we are wise, we receive, not only give, but receive such love on a regular basis. We need to do so. If we are to have enough stores of love to share with others, we have to make sure we spend time receiving it ourselves. This is why the 23rd Psalm basks in that care of God. This is why these women come together in these relationships of faith. In our times, we especially need these relationships. And I think about the events of this past week and the news that we've heard um, that actually ironically has to do with motherhood. Early in this week, we were thrust into a conversation about Roe versus Wade and the potential overturning of that um, Supreme Court ruling from decades ago. I'd like to remind us of what the United Methodist Book of Discipline, this is essentially our rule book, says about this subject. It's important that as Methodists that we be familiar with our denominational stance. It says, we recognize tragic conflicts of life with life that may justify abortion, and in such case we support the legal option of abortion under proper, proper medical procedures by certified medical providers. We are committed also to promoting the diminishment of high abortion rates. The church shall encourage ministries to reduce unintended pregnancies such as comprehensive age-appropriate sexuality education, advocacy in regard to contraception, and supportive initiatives that enhance the quality of life for all women and girls around the globe. These are the words of our book of discipline and a very helpful guide to us during this time. I believe we should also follow the example of these women who gathered together in a time of confusion and loss. They come together for collective wisdom. And they come together in relationship. As, as I do strongly support these words of our book of discipline, I also support and encourage the relationships that give us wisdom to make courageous decisions, especially in the most confusing and trying times 
of our lives. When it comes to this subject, it's terribly challenging for women to deal with these circumstances, as the Book of Discipline says, of life versus life. How to promote a way that truly leads to life. I've come to believe as a principle that matters such as abortion or the right to die, or as we might call it, aid in dying, these are questions that are deeply personal. I've come to realize I have no place telling another person or advocating some law saying what you must do when it comes to your own decision making. These are terribly intimate, deeply personal matters. We need room to decide. Instead of unbending laws, we need good resources and safe choices to equip people to make wise decisions. We need the support of our church, of our community of faith, people to talk to, people who have walked these roads before as we decide these matters of life and death. Wisdom is gained through relationships, through a fabric of faith, not through a one phrase of the law or another. Amen? We need to give people the space and the resources and the choices that they need in all of these terrible, confusing moments of life, but can, which, which can also lead to life under the right circumstances. In other words, we have to be Christ to one another. That's what these women do in this story. They show up when they are grieving the loss of their dear friend Tabitha, this disciple, this leader in their faith. They come together. Their instinct is to be in relationship, not to scatter, not to be afraid, but to become stronger as a fabric of faith. This fabric of faith in Christ transcends all time and distance. It is something that no one can take away for us, from us. And this will bind us together to give us the courage we need. This faith in Jesus Christ is a faith that requires incarnation. God becomes flesh in Jesus. We should become embodied love to one another. Only in these ways can we make the difficult decisions that we must make and find the wisdom we must have. I'm reminded of a story of a boy whose mother was putting him to bed at night and he was having fears about going to bed by himself in that room and he said, Mom, I don't think I'll be able to fall asleep all by myself in my own room. And she said, well, if you fear that you're alone, remember, God's spirit is with you. So a little bit later, he cries out and calls for his mother again and again. And finally, she comes in and she says, did you even try praying to God? I told you God is with you. God will comfort you. And the little boy says, yes, but I want someone who has skin. And this is how we feel. We want someone who has skin. And this is what God has done for us. He's given us Jesus, but he's also given us one another. He's given us our mothers as an indelible reminder that we are loved unconditionally. He's called us to share unconditional love with those around us as well. So let us serve the poor, let us serve the needy, let us be embodiments of Christ's love so that all people may know that they are forevermore woven into this fabric of faith. May it be so. Amen. Let us sing together, Mothering God, You Gave Me Birth.
us pray. Holy Spirit, weave us together in a strong tapestry that transcends time and space. Open our eyes to the friends that you send us so that we may truly receive your love and share it generously with others. We give you thanks and praise for the examples of love we have known in Christ Jesus and in our mothers and all maternal figures who have cared for us. We ask that we would always receive this eternal love, that we might bless others in sharing it. Guide us also, Spirit of Christ, to welcome all people in your name, just as you did in those early days of your church. Lead us through tense times as we now live in and the complex conversations we must have until we treat all persons with dignity, respect, and grace. Guide our nation's leaders beyond politics and pride to seek your will and your compassion for all people. Bless the women of our nation, O oh God. Strengthen them and comfort them. We give you thanks for all of our sisters in your human family. Protect and strengthen them to fulfill your greatest calling on their lives. Holy Spirit, we ask for your peace to be throughout the earth. Comfort and defend all who suffer war and violence. Guide our nation as we stand with those who suffer today in Ukraine. Continue to heal this earth of illness. Cure those who live with COVID and all diseases. Comfort those who have lost loved ones. Bless, O oh God, all mothers and bring us together as families today. We give you thanks for this day in which we can bask in the love, the familial love that we share with each other. Let us always welcome our neighbors and all of your children with the grace that you have shown each of us. For we offer our prayers in your name and lift our praises, petitions, and confessions to you in a time of silent prayer. It is good, Holy Spirit, to find hope and healing in your presence. Your presence that is faithful always. You are always with us, whether our hearts realize it or not. You do not fail us. We lift prayers before you now for many who are in need. And we begin with our home-centered members who cannot be with us in person but who are always with us in spirit and who have served in this life and in this church family so faithfully. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We ask that you bless the ministries of our church family. We pray for our homeless, pardon me, for our, our food ministry. We ask, Lord, that your spirit rest upon all who work, all who receive, that they may come together in your love. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are in the military, especially those who are connected to our church members. We pray for peace, that they may come home and that the world may be joined in love. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We pray with Betsy Critchfield for her sister Susan, who is finally going to have much needed back surgery. We pray that the surgery will relieve her, her severe pain 
and will improve her life. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are without food or without homes to live in. We pray, Lord, that any opportunity we have as individuals or as a church family, we may do something concrete, big or small, to help them. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, your universal church, throughout the world and its mission of love and peace and hope. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And now we turn to the, the prayer that Jesus taught us that means so much to us. We lift it to you, Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue in worship, coming forward as we are able with our gifts and offerings for the work of God's church in the world.
May God's eternal motherly love bless us all and keep us wherever we go. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit remain with us forevermore. Amen.